Hello, welcome and thank you for joining us at today's media briefing. I'm Catherine Roloff, NASA's Press Secretary for the Science Mission Directorate. We'll be recording on Teams, streaming audio on nasa.gov slash nasa live. Right now, millions of Americans are experiencing the effects of extreme weather. There are wildfires raging across North America, flooding in the Northeast, heat waves across the Southwest, wildfire smoke here in our nation's capital, and a record hot June. And NASA is tracking it all. We are here today with NASA leadership, including climate experts, to discuss how NASA provides detailed climate data and research to the world through uh, from space, sky, sea, and land to enable climate solutions. To talk more about our climate work in the wake of record high temperatures, our NASA Administrator Bill Nelson, Kate Calvin, NASA Chief Scientist and Senior Climate Advisor, Karen St. Germain, Director of NASA's Earth Science Division, Gavin Schmidt, Director of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, Carlos Del Castillo, Chief of the Ocean Ecology Laboratory at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, Lee Tran, Aeronautics Director at NASA Ames Research Center, and Tom Wagner, Associate Director for NASA's Earth Action. We will begin with opening remarks from our speakers, and then we'll open it up for questions. To ensure as many people as possible get the opportunity to ask a question, we ask that there be just one question per person. And do please state your name, affiliation, and to whom your question is directed to. Now, let's hear from NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. Hey, everybody. Um, I don't need to chronicle what's happening uh, around the country, around the world. Uh, the fact is, is the Earth is heating up. Uh, just look at the record temperatures that are going around uh, the country on the nightly news. But uh, you can see it uh, in ways like, uh, why has Miami Beach had to spend millions of dollars on pumps uh, to pump out the water during mean high tide that sloshes over the curbs? Uh, the ocean is heating up and the seas are rising. And, and we could go on and on. We want you to be able to ask the questions that you need to ask today. But let me just point out, you think of NASA as a space agency, you think of NASA as an aeronautical research agency, NASA is also a climate agency. We've got 25 satellites up there that are bringing real-time data. That next week on our new website at nasa.gov, you're going to be able to go and pull up the hyperwall that we have in the east lobby of this building that has real-time what is happening. I said real-time. Only the time that it takes because the asset is revolving about the earth every 90 minutes to convey that information to earth of what is happening to currents, to uh, weather currents, to uh, all of the data, the ocean temperatures, the land temperatures, et cetera, et cetera. So we want you to know that you've got a research uh, asset right here at NASA that you can uh, use. Now, uh, we have an instrument called EcoStress. It's on the International Space Station, and it measures the subtle changes in temperature to identify plant stress and it can be used to identify extreme heat in urban areas. I went to Kansas a while ago uh, to visit with farmers. We can tell the farmer the moisture content of his soil, or we can tell him the disease in his crops. We can tell a forest the disease in the crops 
which is a heads up for the forest fire that's coming. Um, this data from EcoStress has been employed to reduce heat absorbed in Los Angeles by the city surf uh, surfaces, such as the asphalt. And in partnership with that city and county, NASA used EcoStress uh, the data to implement the Cool Neighborhood Program. It's a thermal resistant paint that was applied to select streets in Los Angeles. This pilot project found that a thin gray point, uh, a thin gray coating made an asphalt runway reflect the sun like a concrete runway, roadway, making the surrounding areas cooler. So these are some of the examples. In recent months, uh, we've launched a series of satellite missions, SWOT, S-W-O-T, to study surface water. And that's in partnership with the French Space Agency. A TEMPO to study air pollution in collaboration with South Korea and the European Space Agency and Canada. EMIT to study mineral dust. And lo and behold, uh, to study all that dust, we suddenly found out that we had uh, another thing that it was telling us. It was telling us where methane was being emitted around the globe. Methane is one of the two big uh, greenhouse gases that go up in the atmosphere and trap the heat in. And then uh, uh, another uh, satellite mission called Tropics to study uh, tropical cyclones and hurricanes. And uh, I mentioned the Earth Information Center uh, that is gonna be available to you real time on NASA Dot gov. So uh, do you want me to turn it to Kate now? Yes. Okay, Kate Calvin, our chief scientist and uh, climate advisor at NASA. Thank you, sir. So recently we've seen extreme events around the world. In the U.S., we're seeing heat waves, flooding. We're seeing air quality issues due to smoke from wildfires in Canada. They're all impacting people where we live um, and around the world. This June was the hottest June on record, according to NASA analysis, and you'll hear more about that later today. But what we know from science is that human activity and principally greenhouse gas emissions are unequivocally causing the warming that we're seeing on our planet. And this is impacting people and ecosystems around the world. At NASA, we provide end-to-end -end research about climate, from observations to models and applications to technology. So we can provide information on the changes in climate that we're seeing. We can see um, and provide information about the drivers of those changes, like greenhouse gas emissions and the impacts of climate change. We also develop technologies that can help us mitigate or adapt to climate. Just as one concrete example, for wildfire, our observations can show us where fires are burning. They can show burn scars and burn perimeters. We can provide emission, um, information about emissions from fire, which can lead to air quality concerns. And we're also working on using NASA aeronautics technology to help respond to fire. And you'll hear more about that as well today. What, everything we do, we work on providing information to people so they can have make informed decisions. So providing both the data from our satellites and, and models, as well as tools and resources to help people use that. Um, in June, as the administrator mentioned, we opened an Earth Information Center with both a physical space that's here in Washington, D.C., in our headquarters lobby, as well as a virtual space for those that can't come to D.C. Because uh, whether people are living in cities or in rural communities or in suburbs, we're making decisions every day that are influenced by climate. Everything from a home buyer assessing flood risk to a farmer thinking about what to plant or when to water their crops. Um, and what we want to do is make sure that the information we have about our planet is available to people so they can make those decisions better. And so the Earth Information Center will allow users to see the planet 
as uh, and how it's changing and provide easy to use information to support decision making as you as they respond to climate change. And with that, I'll turn it back. Thank you, Kate. Next will be Karen St. Germain, director of NASA's Earth Science Division. Thank you so much. And I'll talk about three main points here. Um, first is the observations. And uh, Administrator Nelson mentioned these briefly. NASA operates a fleet of missions to, to study the Earth as a system, the land, the ice, the atmosphere, and the oceans, and to see how changes in one drive change in others. Today, we're operating over two dozen missions uh, studying our planet. And uh, these observations reveal changes in extreme events and the impacts of climate change. In uh, recent months, we launched four missions that Administrator Nelson mentioned, SWAT, Tempo, EMIT, and Tropics. And we have a couple of upcoming missions, such as PACE and NISAR, which will provide even greater clarity and understanding of how the warming climate is driving change in biological systems or what grows where. That's the first key point is the, the foundation is all of these observations. Second key point, this wide diversity of observations sustained over time has taught us actually much of what we understand uh, about how and why the Earth system, including climate, is changing. The study of climate is the study of carbon cycle and ecosystems, atmospheric composition, water and energy cycle, climate variability and change, weather and atmospheric dynamics. In other words, there's a lot to understand here. And while climate is not just long-term weather, most of us will experience climate change through severe weather, which we've seen recently with drought and heat in the Southwest, flooding in Vermont and the atmospheric rivers uh, in California earlier this year. At NASA, we capture the scientific understanding that we get from these observations um, in, uh, in highly sophisticated data-driven models that then allow us to predict into the future. And Gavin is going to talk to you more in a few minutes about that. Third key point, our science isn't done until we've communicated it. And this has never been more important uh, or compelling than it is today. NASA Earth Science's end-to-end -end capability from technology all the way through what the observations mean today and into the future, that end-to-end -end capability allows us the opportunity to deliver actionable science and information so more people can see the Earth as we see it. Our Earth Science to Action strategy seeks to accelerate scientific discovery and the use of Earth Science by leveraging that end-to-end -end capability for the benefit of humanity. Informing decisions ranging from a farmer assessing what to do with a single field to global leaders weighing decisions impacting the entire world. So our goal is to put scientific information and understanding out in ways that help the public. We do this by supporting a dozen uh, other federal agencies. For example, we support FEMA in responding to, to extreme events and USDA's drought monitor. We develop easy to use tools to address decision maker needs at, uh, at the state, local and tribal level, like providing information to support fire managers in anticipating responding to and recovering from wildfires. And then finally, making that information easily accessible through platforms like the Earth Information Center and online so that all of our citizens can be informed. And Tom is going to tell you more about that in a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Next, we have Gavin Schmidt, director of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies. Gavin. Thank you very much. Um, I, we are seeing uh, unprecedented changes uh, all over the world. Uh, the heat waves that we're seeing in the US, in, uh, in Europe, in China, uh, are, are demolishing records uh, left, right and center. This is not a surprise. Uh, we have been tracking the changes in temperature over time uh, since uh, since the since the 1980s when we when we first started to put together global estimates of how temperatures are changing uh, those records go back to the late 19th century um, and we can see that uh, there has been a 
decade on decade uh, increase in temperatures uh, throughout the last uh, four decades. Uh, this last June was the warmest June on record, um, and we anticipate with the uh, with the understanding of what's going on on a day by day basis uh, that July is likely to be the warmest uh, absolute month on record uh, in that record, and and that's going to be a, a record that uh, that effectively uh, goes back many hundreds, if not thousands uh, of years. Um, we don't see this every year. Uh, the last uh, time that we saw this was in uh, July and August of uh, 2016, uh, when we were coming off a, uh, a super El Nino event uh, in the, the winter of 2015-2016. Uh, we haven't got there with the current El Nino event. So uh, as many of you know, we have an El Nino event that is uh, emerging uh, in the tropical Pacific, um, but it's really only just emerged. And so what we're seeing now is not in uh, is is not really due to that El Nino, though it is it is playing a small part in the global mean change. Uh, but what we're seeing is the the overall warmth pretty much everywhere, uh, particularly in the oceans. We've been seeing uh, record-breaking uh, sea surface temperatures even outside of the tropics uh, for many months now. Uh, and we will anticipate that uh, is going to continue. Uh, and the reason why we think that's going to continue uh, is because we continue to put greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And until we stop doing that, temperatures will keep on rising. Um, and the temperatures that we see on an annual, on a monthly basis, uh, they're going to be reflected in the daily uh, data. Now, the daily data that everybody's been looking at uh, recently comes from uh, from uh, reanalyses uh, that ingest an enormous amount of both in situ and satellite data uh, from NASA satellites, but also from uh, European satellites and Japanese satellites. Uh, to put that together inside a model and then, you know, fill out uh, in a physically consistent way uh, what's happening. Um, now, each different reanalysis system is a little bit different. They use different uh, data. They, uh, they, they have different codes. And so uh, the, the coherence between each individual uh, reanalysis system on a day by day basis is probably not that high, uh, but the overall pattern that we're seeing of tremendous heat in the oceans, particularly in the North Atlantic, uh, tremendous heat uh, in the global mean uh, that's really knocking uh, knocking out of the park the, the, the previous records, uh, those things are going to be robust and they will be reflected in the uh, more uh, standard uh, global temperature um, statistics that uh, NASA and NOAA um, and uh, the Hadley Center in the UK release on a monthly uh, and then annual basis. Uh, what's happening now is certainly increasing the chances that 2023 will be uh, the warmest year on record. Uh, my calculations suggest that that's right now uh, about a 50-50 chance. Uh, others have suggested it's more like an 80% chance, uh, but we anticipate that 2024 will be an even warmer warmer year because we're going to be starting off with that El Nino event uh, that's uh, that's building now. That will peak uh, towards the end of this year, and how big that is is going to have a big impact on the following year's st uh, statistics. And so this story, uh, these impacts are going to continue, and we're going to be seeing this uh, pretty much uh, throughout for the rest of this year and into next year. And so we could be seeing, as we've seen previously in you know, 19, uh, 1987, 1988, 1997, and 1998, 2015, 2016, were both years in which you had a nascent uh, El Nino, a record warm year uh, that year, and then the next year uh, was, was even warmer. And the impacts from those uh, kinds of events uh, are going to be uh, continuing to make uh, headlines uh, across the world. Uh, the efforts that we're putting into uh, seeing what's happening, understanding what's happening and making predictions uh, for what's happening, uh, what will happen in the future through uh, modeling uh, of, of, of various kinds, including uh, full Earth system models, are uh, is, is absolutely crucial to us understanding what's going to go on. Um, and then to deal both with uh, adapting to that, uh, but also trying to prevent it from happening uh, by uh, informing uh, decision makers about mitigate, uh, potential mitigation of X. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. Next, we will hear from Carlos Del Castillo. 
Chief of the Ocean Ecology Laboratory at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. So the oceans are also suffering heat waves. Actually, the oceans are running a fever. Uh, the waters around Florida are over 90 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is extremely complicated for marine species like coral reefs, uh, marine plants, and marine animals. And uh, these issues with uh, ocean temperature is not a problem that stays in the ocean. Uh, it affects everything else. Uh, increases in ocean temperature causes uh, increases in extreme weather events, torrential rains in coastal areas, but also inshore. They, have, they help fuel the intensity of hurricanes. They increase sea level with increases in coastal inundations, like the administrator mentioned. Miami Beach is getting flooded just because of high tides. Okay, this is completely unprecedented. And uh, all this CO2 that we're putting into the atmosphere, which is causing the increase in, in temperature, a lot of it gets into the ocean, which acidifies the water. And this is not very good for a lot of marine species. We have increased the acidity of the ocean about 25% since the uh, Industrial Revolution. And finally, we are seeing now that the biology of the ocean is changing. And we can say right now that global warming is contributing to changes in the amount of marine plants in the ocean. And why should we care? Well, these little marine, marine plants, they are at the bottom of the food web. They produce about 50% of the oxygen that we are breathing. And of course, the ocean help modulate the weather in the planet. The oceans offer us goods and services like transportation, food, medicine. And uh, very important, about 40% of the world population lives around the coast. And in the US, if we take all the counties and parishes and we make a hypothetical country, they will have the third largest GDP of the world, excluding the rest of the US and China. And these areas which are overpopulated, which have a strong economic influence, and are very important for the rest of the marine ecosystem are also extremely susceptible to global warming. Now, fortunately, we have been looking at the ocean for a long time. Uh, we started making satellite measurements of sea surface temperatures in the 90s, in the 70s, I'm sorry. In the 90s, we started measuring sea surface height. And now with the SWOT mission, we are increasing our capabilities measurements and since 1997, we started to do very good measurements of ocean biology. Uh, many international partners have joined us in that fray. And pretty soon, in you know, January of 2024, we will launch the PACE mission, which will continue these very important measurements, but also bring some precedented technical capabilities of we are going to be able to see in great detail how the biology of the ocean works in general, but very important, how it's changing with respect to global warming. Uh, of course, the PACE mission will also collect very good measurements about the atmosphere, aerosols, clouds, and, uh, and after that, we're planning the Glimmer mission, which will collect extremely good measurements of ocean biology in the coastal areas of the United States, the Caribbean, and South America. Uh, but the key thing is that aside for the satellite measurements, we also do measurements from airplanes, from boats, we have drones, we have laboratory work, uh, modeling analysis, and the key is uh, we take all this data to not only understand the ocean, but also to understand the air system. And we make this data available to all the community, and in particular to the policymakers, so they can you know, do their job and make the correct decisions. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Up next, we have Wee Tran, aeronautics director at NASA's Ames Research Center. Good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Wee Tran, and I'm Director of Aeronautics at NASA Ames Research Center. As you know, NASA Aeronautics has over a century of, techno of innovation in aviation, and we continue to develop green technology for next generation aircraft and sustainable energy for our aircraft propulsion. This innovation will ensure that the U.S. will be the leader in aviation. At the same time, we want to also working on technology that would address the impact of aviation on our climate. Last year, the Aeronautic Mission Directorate initiated 
of Sustainable Flight National Partnership. This initiative allow us to accelerate and making good progress on net zero aviation by 2050. One of the, one of the new uh, X plane called X66A uh, that will be new having new technology for sustainable aviation for single aisle. Another another aspect of our effort is the electric propulsion powertrain demonstrator. In this activity, we are trying to take a look at the feasibility of fully electric power aircraft. In parallel, in airspace management, we are also looking at ways to reduce fuel burn and emission for our current commercial aviation today. As you know, as, as more aircraft in the air, flying people and good around the globe, we will contribute to the climate change impact from aviation. So are we looking at new technology in airspace operation and aircraft technology, working with the FAA and airline partner to demonstrate that we can reduce fuel burn and emission for the aviation sector? Now, how does aeronautics helping in wildland fire mitigation. We did that by looking at new technology such as unmanned aircraft and drone to begin looking at how we're going to help the, the emergency response system to uh, be able to suppress the, the wildfire uh, from the air. Last year, we started the new project called Advanced Capability for Emergency Response and Operation. This project, we will work with our federal government agency, industry, and other partners to come up with way to suppress the wildfire on the air. And, and this would help us to be able to what we call the second shift, which means that once the wildfire fighter can go home or go back to their, their barrack, this our unmanned and remotely operated aircraft with new air traffic management system would allow us to suppress the fire at nine, which is when the wildfire is, is, is relatively calm. So we continue to do this on aeronautics, utilizing our aeronautics expertise um, and working with our industry to address the growing threat of the wildland fire and other um, a climate disaster. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. And up next, Tom Wagner, Associate Director for NASA Earth Action. Hey, thank you very much. And I'll be brief because I know we want to get to questions. But Earth Action, or as we call it, Earth Science to Action, is our new strategic planning theme for the next few years at NASA for all of Earth Sciences. It has three basic components. Number one, we want to get the data out. You know, you heard those earlier examples. We talked about helping farmers plan irrigation better, helping a city planner deal with sea level rise. There's even things we do like with the disaster response for the flooding in Vermont and Pennsylvania, where we do our best to help FEMA. And what we want to do is scale up those efforts so we can take NASA data and apply them to whatever challenge society brings. You know, personally, we're, we're working a lot right now on climate change, but we're also interested in health and every other aspect of challenges facing humanity. The second big thing we want to do is get the information that's at the cutting edge research that we do with all of our satellites, models, and other things. And we want to bring that to the fore. A really good example of that, which the administrator mentioned earlier, is our greenhouse gas center. But what we're going to do is take the cutting edge measurements we have of methane release around the world. We're going to pull that together with the models and other data, and we're going to have a center so you can pinpoint where those greenhouse gases are coming from. I want to point out too, though, we're going to do that work in partnership with other agencies, right? Our big partners there for the Greenhouse Gas Center are the Environmental Protection Agency and also NOAA. But that brings me to the last component of our Earth to Action Strategy, Earth Science to Action Strategy, which is bottoms up. 
we really want to hear what society's needs are, and we have a real legacy of doing that with our applied sciences program. An example of that is University of Puerto Rico wanted more um, air quality forecasts, especially in light of more dust coming from Africa, and we were able to help there. And we're going to make every effort to identify even more of those needs and help society meet its challenges with all the great stuff coming out of our 25 missions orbiting the Earth right now. And with that, I'll kick it back to Catherine. Thank you, Tom, and thank you all for that great information. For our in-person media, please join Kate Calvin and Karen St. Germain after this media briefing for a tour of our new Earth Information Center. We're ready for your questions, and to get into the question queue, please raise your hand on Teams. The audio live stream on nasa.gov slash nasa live will be available for playback. I will go in the order of hands raised, and I see Jeff Faust, you are first. Good afternoon. This is Jeff Faust of Space News. Um, question. I know NASA requested a significant increase in Earth science funding in its 2024 budget proposal um, to support, among other things, climate science research. The appropriations bills currently working their way through the House and Senate would provide NASA with at best flat funding for Earth science. If that turns out to be the outcome of what NASA gets uh, in 2024, how that, does that affect um, these climate science and other climate initiatives that you've been talking about? Jeff, that's for me. Uh, we're going to have the least possible effect on any climate science uh, this is a huge priority for us. It's a huge priority for me personally, having uh, lived through this as the senator from Florida and seeing my, my state being uh, completely challenged every day, every hurricane season. And it is a huge priority for Joe Biden uh, as president, but I saw him as senator uh, be at the forefront on the changes that are occurring uh, in uh, our earth, and we're getting hotter. Now, let me just point out, there's going to be less money. Uh, there's going to be less money because a huge bipartisan agreement with an overwhelming bipartisan vote prevented the country from going into financial default and going over a financial cliff. As a result of that, part of that agreement was to basically go back for fiscal year 24, which starts in just a few months, October the 1st, to go back to essentially no more than the 23 appropriations of which we are in right now, fiscal year 2023. Uh, the House bill has brought NASA out uh, with a fairly close to the 2023 appropriations. The Senate bill, about 386 um, million less. The compromise is going to be somewhere in between. There are many twists and turns before this final agreement. But in the process, you're going to see yours truly that is going to be trying to protect this climate science. Uh, and so I hope uh, that gives you some uh, reassurance, Jeff. Great. We will move on to the media in the room. Seth, Seth Bornstein. Where is it? Seth Bornstein for AP for, for both. It's one question, but for both Gavin and Dr. Calvin, in terms of the summer records and temperatures and extremes we're seeing, Gavin, you said it was no surprise, but some of these things are, other scientists have said, are a little more off the chart than expected. Which of these are more uh, surprising to you and disturbing to you? And, and, and is it arriving earlier 
than you expected, some of the levels of these extremes? Yeah, maybe I'll start and then I'll turn to Gavin. Um, so the last nine years have been the warmest since modern record keeping began. We're on a trend of increasing temperatures and with those increasing temperatures, we are seeing more impacts and that's something that we as scientists have known for a while. Um, some of the research back into greenhouse gases and the effect go back to laboratory experiments in the 1850s and over time um, we've you know, broadened our understanding of how the planet works and what, what to expect. Um, I think what's sometimes different for people is when you actually experience it in in your neighborhood where you live. And I think that's what we're seeing now is that people are feeling these impacts, um, but we have seen these trends and rises in temperature for a while um, and we know what's driving it. And I'll turn to Gavin um, now for the for his insight. Yeah, thanks Seth, that's a, that's a great question. Um, uh, so things like, you know, longest continuous over 110 degree temperatures in, in Phoenix. Uh, Shocking, but not really surprising. Um, breaking records in Rome and Spain and China. Shocking, but not surprising. Um, I, th I think the uh, the departure in the North Atlantic uh, sea surface temperatures uh, uh, that th that raises an eyebrow uh, for me. That's uh, that's that's uh, that's an interesting uh, phenomena that seems to have happened very uh, quickly, um, and you know is 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 related to uh, perhaps changes in aerosols, perhaps, uh, you know, extreme uh, NAO um, uh, behavior, perhaps differences in uh, kind of dust feedback. So we were talking about that earlier um, uh, with uh, with the Sahara. Uh, all of those things may be playing a role in that specific um, instance. And I think that that's, that's certainly a, uh, a situation uh, to watch and to uh, dig in a little bit deeper once we have, you know, more data and, uh, and and the time to uh, to really analyze uh, what's going on, um, uh, but you know we've we've been predicting that the rainfall is going to get more uh, intense. Uh, we've been predicting that that goes roughly, uh, you know, seven to 10 percent more uh, intense rain uh, as you warm the, the planet by about a degree. Um, that's what we have done, and and that is that is happening, and so, I, I, you know, it's 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 not, uh, you know, even even the things that that are unprecedented are not surprising. Now we have to be a little bit careful when we're talking about like truly unprecedented uh, situations, like you know, like the forty degree temperature in uh, in the UK last year, and uh, you know, and similar, you know, you know, quite frankly, um, uh, off the charts uh, warming in, in China uh, last week. Uh, it's very hard to tell from the instrumental record whether these are now something that's going to happen you know once every 10 years or whether it's still uh locally like a one in a thousand year or one in ten thousand year uh kind of event uh and our models we can't evaluate their estimates of these kinds of really really rare extremes because they still are rare that's why they're making the headlines uh if the model says it's a one in a hundred chance or a one in uh, a ten thousand year uh, chance, it's very difficult to say whether the models are correct or, or, or not. You know, you you really need to build our understanding, uh, looking at the whole kind of extreme tale of the temperatures and the rainfalls, and we haven't really got enough data to evaluate those. And so, so. When people say, "Oh, the models, uh, you know, might not have predicted this," it's it's not quite clear what what the standard is that people are holding the models to, because we we have a we have a, a real uh, lack of uh, time and information to really assess these things. Um, but the the trends that we're seeing over larger aggregated areas in rainfall intensity, in heat wave occurrence, in heat wave intensity, uh, all of those things are, are, are playing out uh, pretty much as, as the models have been predicting for, uh, for, for years. And Seth, you'll be able to see a lot of this real time displayed visually as it's happening on the Earth Information Center. Great, thank you all. I will turn the next question over to Haley Smith. 
Hi, thanks for doing this. This is Haley Smith with the LA Times. Um, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about artificial intelligence and what role it might play in some of the projects you described today and, and what role you see it playing in the future as you continue to track and respond to climate change. Go ahead, Gavin. Uh, hi. Yeah, that, that was uh, that's that's another great question. And so um, NASA is uh, at the forefront of funding uh, research into um, uh, machine learning and, and uh, digital twin technologies uh, for uh, climate and earth science. Um, we're seeing uh, work that uh, that is being done to uh, use artificial intelligence to help tune models to calibrate them better to the real world. Uh, we're seeing uh, efforts to improve um, uh, process-based understanding that we can then, you know, include those in the models and, and, and do it in a, in a, in hopefully a, a faster and, uh, and more accurate way. Uh, we're using machine learning to, to downscale impacts so that the models that have a relatively coarse resolution are uh, so that we can use that, uh, the information that we have from the observational record uh, to try and uh, make uh, more uh, more accurate uh, projections at the local scale. Um, we're not. Uh, I, I, uh, this is me speaking personally. I, I, we're, we're not going to suddenly see machine learning uh, tell us what's going to happen uh, to climate. So you know, we're not going to just be able to look at the world, uh, put it through uh, something like uh, uh, ChatGPT or, 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 or DeepMind, and then it's suddenly going to be able to tell us what uh, what climate is going to do in the future. Uh, our our, our information about the future, we don't have enough data from different kinds of climates to be able to constrain uh, in a purely data-driven mode uh, what the climate change is going to be. Um, but we are using uh, machine learning as much as we can in a kind of physics-guided way uh, so that it, it still kind of maintains what we know from fundamental first principles uh, to make better predictions. And so uh, we will be, uh, I think, increasingly seeing uh, um, efforts uh, to use uh, machine learning uh, to do that where we have, you know, really uh, very uh, large amounts of data um, and relatively well constrained physical problems, then we can we can use machine learning to, to inform those things. Um, and so uh, we can be using the process based data from the satellites, we can be using uh, the high resolution models uh, to inform the coarser resolution models, we can be looking at uh, more complex and involved models that perhaps Perhaps include uh, chemistry and aerosols, and we can use those to inform the uh, the, the models that don't have that. Uh, and I think you're going to be seeing a lot more uh, efforts along those lines in in uh, uh, perhaps uh, perhaps in in the months to come. Uh, we're actually running a session at AGU uh, on machine learning for uh, for for climate and weather. Uh, and so uh, I I I'd welcome I'd welcome you to uh, to that uh, in in uh, San Francisco in December. I'll just briefly add two key points. Uh, this is Karen St. Germain. So we are, uh, as, as, as Gavin discussed in the context of climate, we are seeing AI and machine learning uh, come through across all of our science disciplines uh, as, as, a, as another tool that people use uh, to go after science questions of all sorts. That's gonna become increasingly impactful uh, because just w within the next two years, between SWAT and NISAR, we will have doubled the entirety of the NASA Earth Science data holdings. So to manage, to, to extract meaning from ever increasing volumes of data, these are going to become increasingly important tools. That's first point. Second point is we are also seeing a tremendous amount of sophistication and excitement in our early career scientists around AI and machine learning. And this is a key part of, uh, of our efforts to bring new people into our, our field and help us tackle the, the challenges that society is seeing. Thank you both. Up next, we have Darna Noor. Hi, everyone. Um, Darna Noor from The Guardian here. Thanks so much for holding this. Um, last month, Copernicus, the, Europeans Earth, uh, the European Union's Earth observation arm, said that the first few days of June um, breached that 1.5 degrees Celsius increase 
um, compared with pre-industrial times and said that it was probably the first time that ever happened since industrialization. Uh, just wondering what you all think about uh, the potential that that could occur again um, and what the sort of record heat that we're seeing right now could mean for uh, another breach of that 1.5 degree mark. Maybe I'll start. This is Kate Calvin. Then I'll turn to Gavin for um, some uh, to, to add in some extra. The, the point I want to make is, you know, when we talk about 1.5 degrees Celsius, often when scientists talk about it or when you hear about it in in, in sort of the policy arena, we're talking about global warming um, over long term, so 20 year averages. And so a, a single day or a month or even a year exceeding 1.5 degrees Celsius doesn't mean we've reached that level. Um, but I will turn to Gavin if he wants to add anything on. Um, whether we've experienced that before. You are muted. Sorry. Um, I'm not actually sure that that statement from Copernicus is true. Uh, I, I think in um, in January and February of 2016, we exceeded 1.5 um, degrees uh, above the, the pre-industrial uh, for, I think, February and March uh, of, of, of that year for the whole month. Uh, so so that's not unprecedented. Um, I think, you know, the, the, um, the focus that we have Kind of gone into in recent months, uh, uh, focused on the on the on the daily uh, data. That's a relatively new uh, thing, but it's 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 more a function of the availability of that very nice website that the University of Maine has put together uh, than it is of something fundamentally different that, that that's going on. Um, uh, as Kate mentioned, uh, you know, 1.5 on a on a daily basis or even a monthly basis um, is I. I I don't think unprecedented and I don't think um, in and of itself cause for concern. Obviously, you know, as we get warmer, we're going to go through more and more uh, days, more and more months and eventually years uh, that uh, that do exceed that temperature. Um, and uh, and as we get warmer, we are going to see more impacts, uh, but nothing nothing fundamental changes nothing fundamental changes at, at 1.5 right so 1.49 or 1.51 we're not going to be able to distinguish uh, the difference but but we know that impacts increase uh, much faster than the linear change in the global mean and so any uh, any long-term change that gets us uh, closer to that or past that um, is going to have an outsized uh, impact uh, on uh, things like extreme rain heat waves uh, fire uh, sea level and the like. Great, thank you. Uh, is Are there any other questions? We have time for one more. Questions in the room? All righty, well, this has been a great discussion of climate work in the wake of record high temperatures. That's gonna wrap things up for us today. A list of our climate resources is available on our home site, nasa.gov. And please, whenever you're in DC, visit our new Earth Information Center. It's open Mondays through Fridays from 8.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. And our panelists are available for interviews. And if you have any follow-up questions, please send them to me at katherine.a.olup at nasa.gov. And we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Have a good evening.